Okay, so we've got the story of uh, Adam and Eve uh, developing. Actually, the way this is written is the story is developing on four levels simultaneously. So it's like, uh, imagine you've got a movie or something, you've got four camera angles. So you've got four cameras looking at the same thing from different angles. And if you remember that idea, if you remember the idea of the same story being told from four different angles, it'll help, it'll help you as you read through the passages, you know, as, the, as the changes shift. In a movie, you've got a script that says, you know, camera one and then this angle, camera two, you know, but in Genesis, there's no such, uh, there's no such uh, direction. You have to figure out, oh, now they've backed up and given us you know, the big story. So here are some of the angles. First of all, there's the close-up, and the close-up of the first family, you know, Adam and Eve. Uh, the creation, their disobedience, the effect of their disobedience on their family, the loss of their garden home, the loss of the relationship that they had with God, the conflict between the brothers. You know, we talked about that, like Cain and Abel, we talked about that last week. That's the close-up shot. Okay? Then we have another angle, and that is kind of looking at society, you know, back up a little bit and getting a bigger, a bigger picture. And uh, what Genesis shows us is the beginning of the deterioration of the world. Now it's slow at first, you know, merely you know, a harder task, if you wish, of, draw, uh, of drawing a living from the earth, because God said to, uh, uh, to Adam, you know, the earth you know, gave you, but now you're going you're to earn your living by the sweat of your brow, so we see that. And also the disintegration of the family because of murder, and then later on we'll see uh, new patterns of social breakdown because of polygamy. So there you have a bit of a backup, you know, a bit of a broader view. Then the third angle is the idea of the seed of promise. So we have the first mention and the tracking of God's promise of salvation. And that's like a thread that runs from Genesis all the way to Revelation, this idea that God has made a promise that He'll save man and so on and so forth. You know, uh, in Genesis we refer to it as, as the seed of promise. So you've got that angle. Every once in a while the story's being told and all of a sudden they switch over and they focus in on this seed of, you know, it's like, well, how's the seed of promise doing? How's that coming along? Okay, so we have that particular angle. And then the fourth one is the war of the two seeds. Okay, so the first mention and the tracking of God's promise of salvation, God's promise to Eve regarding her offspring, a witness that that promise was believed as we see Abel offering sacrifice, you know, an acceptable sacrifice uh, to God, of course, that, that's not the, the, you know, the seed of promise. And then we see the war of the seeds that I mentioned between the seed of woman and the seed of Satan. Uh, so just not to get confused here, four different angles, close up, a little uh, you know, backing up a wider panoramic view of society, then uh, two other angles. One, the seed of promise, how God is fulfilling that promise throughout the ages, and then the war of the seeds. That's a whole other thing, how this war is continuously going on, actually beginning in Genesis and working its way all throughout the Bible. And we see the ongoing struggle for dominance over man in every generation, you know, the woman is deceived at first, and then what happens? Well, Cain is seduced uh, to anger and murder. There's, we, see, we see the war continuing in the next generation. And we'll see each generation, this same struggle continue until Christ comes. He's the seed of promise and wins the final victory. He crushes the head of Satan, the promise that God made. Uh, in Genesis. And how does he crush the head of Satan? Well, he beats death, he resurrects from the dead. Let's read Hebrews chapter uh, 2, verses 4 and 15, 14 and 15, um, where we see in the New Testament a reference to this seed, you know, this promised seed that would ultimately be victorious. The Hebrew writes about it, he says, therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. And so uh, the Hebrew writer summarizes in just a few verses the victory 
the, the seed of promise has the victory. And what is, it, what is the victory? He takes away the power of death from Satan, now that there is the resurrection. And of course, the struggle continues today with the seed, but it's to lure away people from the truth. The actual battle has already been fought, it's already been you know, won on the cross. I think the idea is, we, we say it this way in, in you know, modern terms, the game is ours to lose. The game is ours to lose. You know, we've, the Lord has already had a victory over Satan. Death has already been destroyed. We have the promise if, if that we are saved because of our faith in Christ. I mean, it's, it's ours to lose after that. You know? And so many people, I have to say, in you know, personal experience, I've watched so many Christians just throw their faith away, just throw it away. You know? And usually by neglect, not, not by some huge, terrible thing that happens, you know, you know, one bad thing after another and eventually they're worn out and they, they just can't continue anymore. I mean, just carelessly, just throw their faith away you know, because they're not paying attention or they're not careful uh, with it. Okay, so tonight we're going to continue in chapter four and we're going you know, to look at the family level, we're going to look at the close-up here, a close-up shot, as we see the result of Cain's act and how God deals with Cain. Then we're going to move to a wider shot of society and the development. So we're going to look at two angles tonight, the close-up and then the, you know, the wider shot of society and how it develops. So let's go to Genesis chapter four, verse nine. It says, then the Lord, now we know what's happened, right? I mean, Cain has brought Abel out into the field and murdered him, okay? So now God is speaking to Cain. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? So that's how many times have we heard that? <laughs> People say that thing. So at first, God had met Cain at the sacrifice altar, remember? And told him, you know, your sacrifice is not acceptable. You're not acceptable. And he warned him, you know, sin is that, you, you better be careful. You're heading for trouble. But now there is no sacrifice. There is no worship because sin dulls our interest and desire for worship. You know, uh, the Lord finds Cain, He doesn't find him worshiping anywhere, He just finds him. And so now God finds Cain to deal with him. God doesn't really need the information, but like Adam and Eve, He opens up the question in order to elicit from Cain some sort of answer, some sort of repentance. You know, it's like a bad thing has happened, you know, you've done that with your children. You know what they've done, uh, whatever it is. You know, they, they, they poured milk on the cat or something like that. You know what's happened and you know who did it. But you, know, you, you want to give them a chance, right? You want to say, so do you know what happened here? <laughs> do you know what happened to the cat to give them the opportunity and say, well, Ma, I didn't do it on purpose. I had my glass and you know, whatever, whatever the stories. It's the same thing. You know, God kind of approaches him. Obviously, Cain has not come to God to confess and ask for mercy. That would have been the thing he should have done. I lost my temper, I was jealous, I, I was in a rage. What I did was foolish and harmful and stupid and uh, you know, how can this be fixed? Can you help me? No, that's not his attitude. Cain responds to God in two ways. First of all, he lies. He says, I don't know. <laughs> he just killed him in the field, of course he knows. And to me, I don't know, that's the answer that most teenagers give their parents when their parents ask them, you know, how come there's a dent in my car? I don't know, you know what I'm saying? Who trashed the, you know, who stripped the gears on the lawnmower? I don't know, you know. So Cain, you know, he's the first, if you wanted to know where does that come from, Cain. He's the first one that said to God, I don't know. And then of course he challenges God. He challenges, imagine, he challenges God's right to question him. He's saying to God, hey, he's not my responsibility, he's your responsibility, I'm not my brother's keeper, what are you asking me for? That's your job. Pretty bold, huh? And so in verse 10, let's read, he said, what have you done? God is saying, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. So now God is no longer going to speak to him in tones of mercy. That, 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 that ship has sailed now with Cain's attitude. 
Now it's going to be with a tone of judgment that is going to come forth. Abel is not there, but God's law through Abel's blood must be satisfied. There is a law there. The blood itself, in a way, appeals to God for justice, an eye for an eye. And you know, later on in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, God will articulate the law of capital punishment. Here he's, he, you know, he, he uh, demonstrates the idea that he is allowed to judge him and there will be a judgment for capital punishment, but later on you know, the, the, the law for capital punishment is articulated and we'll, we'll get there when we get to Genesis chapter 9. And so we read in verse 11 and 12, it says, now, now God is speaking to Cain, now you are cursed from the ground which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. So in this case, murder, God does not execute punishment that is due immediately, but He lists the consequences of this sin in uh, Cain's life. And so what will happen? What is the curse? Well, first of all, uh, the land, which was already more difficult than it was in the garden, will no longer respond to him because he shed innocent blood. You, you've shed innocent blood in, into the ground, and so the ground where you, you, know, you got your food, it's not going to work for you anymore. A nation you know, always pays, there, there's an eternal principle here, a nation always pays the price for its sins, just like individuals pay a price for sin. Nations also pay a heavy price for their, uh, for their sins. You know, uh, Japan in the war, you know, and so on and so on, Germany, you know, I mean, reduced to rubble, most of it, much of it, uh, after the war. Uh, thankfully, we've never had a war in, in that sense in the modern age, we had a civil war, of course, but never had a war here where enemies came other than 9-11, but you know what I'm saying, like World War II where bombers were bombing cities, we haven't had that. But in our history, you know, in the history of America, there, there have been national sins, collective sins, right? Slavery, for example, institutionalized, legalized slavery, that was, that was wrong, that was sinful. And, and aren't we paying for that sin? Generations later, the, the, out, the, out, you know, the outcome of that of that particular sin uh, still you know, bothers the nation uh, today. Um, what, what is another great, what other uh, innocent blood do we shed every single day, millions of times a year? Yeah, little babies that are aborted. You, know? you, don't, think that, you don't think that there's going to be a price to pay one day for all of that innocent blood shed? Whew, it's kind of scary. But anyways, the point here uh, is that uh, God tells him, you've shed innocent blood in the ground, you are a farmer, you, know, you, you raised, that, the ground's not going to work for you anymore. And then secondly, he will become a wanderer. He's allowed to live, contrary to the law of you know, capital punishment, God allows him to live, but his life is going to be an unpleasant one. Uh, his life will be a state of restlessness. This word wanderer doesn't just mean geographically, but inside a state of restlessness. You know how you, know how you feel sometimes? You're you just don't know where to go, what to do. We have those feelings from time to time, but this was, the, this was going to be his state of being from now on. Interesting that in Buddhism, for example, the, the Buddhist religion, the Buddhist religion claims that the essential problem with mankind is restlessness. And everything in that religion, okay, their teaching, their training, meditation, so on and so forth, is all meant, all designed to deal with the essential problem of man's restlessness. And hopefully, not hopefully, but what they try to do is get individuals to a point where they do not feel that restlessness uh, anymore. Anyways, this, um, uh, this state, has, a, has a, a, a hold on him and will continue to follow him wherever he goes. Perhaps a reason for this punishment is that Cain would be a visible reminder of the effects of sin and God's justice. 
again, speculating, but you know, if you're asking, why did it allow him to live? You know, well, perhaps as a, as a sign to others. Verse 13, it says, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face I will be hidden, and I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. So finally, you get some, finally he gets Cain's, you know, he gets his attention with the curse. Cain finally cries out for help. He's less proud now, less rebellion, and he comes to grips with the punishment that he needs to bear. Verse 14, he reviews the punishment and in his words we see the third and most painful part of the curse on him, and that is, he will no longer behold the face of the Lord. He will no longer uh, commune with the Lord as he did in the past. You know, at least when he was speaking with the Lord, he may have been in disagreement, he may have been in rebellion, so on and so forth, but at least he was having a dialogue with him. Before he was rebellious and arrogant, but at least, as I mentioned, there was a relationship. Now even that is taken away. Sin, the lesson here, always separates us from God, always. It always does that. And there's always a psychological, you know, when we hurt spiritually, we also hurt psychologically. It also seems that the people of his time knew the law of justice for killing and Cain saw his life as being a constant fugitive from those in society who would justify the taking of his life in order to satisfy innocent blood. You want to have a modern counterpart? Without mentioning names here, because this is going to be on video, but you know that individual, those two individuals that had that altercation where a young man was shot to death and another one went on trial you know, and he claimed you know, uh, self-defense? Remember the Martin trial, self-defense? Well, the young man that was shot and killed, I mean, he's dead now, he's dead and gone, but the one who went to, to trial, he was, he was found innocent, wasn't he? The court absolved him of, that, of a crime, okay? However, if you, uh, you know, read stories or reports about his life after the trial, he lives in constant fear. He carries a weapon with him and he doesn't give his address out because he's always afraid that somebody will, you know, because of their anger, because they believe he, he killed that young man who was innocent, will just take justice into their own hands and kill him themselves. And so uh, if you're wondering, you know, how did Cain feel? Well, there's a modern counterpart. He's thinking, wow, I spilled innocent blood. You know, maybe somebody's going to take my life. After all, we have to remember, Abel was known and he was loved as a righteous man. So it's not like Abel, nobody knew him. People knew him. So we read in verse 15, so the Lord said to him, therefore whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain so that no one finding him would slay him. And so to guarantee that his life would be spared, I mean, if God did not execute him, he would not allow anyone else to execute him. God gave him a sign or a mark. And you know, people say, well, what is it? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> the Bible doesn't say. <laughs> the Hebrew word is sign. We don't know what it was, but with time, others knew of God's provision for Cain. And so the sign must have been effective. Uh, some people say that the sign uh, you know, was a, the, a color or something like that, but we don't, we don't know what it is. All we know is that it was obvious to the people of that time that uh, Cain uh, was under the protection of God in some way and they were not allowed to take vengeance on him. It seems from what we know about Cain's later life that even the sign he had did not give him peace of mind and he did indeed wander and left the ground for living in the city or living in cities. All right. 
just like that other individual we're talking about who constantly carries a weapon with him and so on and so forth. The trial is over, the event has passed, but he always fears for his life. All right, so now from the close-up perspective, okay, that camera angle featuring the relationship of Cain and God, the story now refocuses on the development and the deterioration of society. So we had a close-up, now the camera backs up and takes a wide view of what's going on in society, largely caused by what has taken place with Cain. Now I want you to remember that this is the world before the flood, in an environment where both nature and man are relatively free from illness and harmful environmental factors that cause decay. Most of archeology span deals with events and artifacts that were present after the flood. So we're examining a life and a society and, a, and an environment that is very, very strange to us, okay? And, and we have only information from the Bible that describes it to us. So just keep that in mind as we uh, go forward here. So Genesis chapter four, verse 16, it says, Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. The word Nod means wandering. And so it would suggest that Cain left the proximate area of the garden and began to wander. Or he lived in a place called Nod, but he lived as a nomad without uh, fixed roots. Verse 17. Cain had relations with his wife and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. And he built a city and he called the name of the city Enoch after the name of his son. So now Cain begins his family line. The sign is fulfilling its purpose. He lives long enough to produce children. Now Cain's wife was related to him somehow, obviously. But in that time, it was genetically possible. It was socially necessary. How else are you going to multiply? How else are you going to populate the earth? And it was morally acceptable because God said to multiply, so this was the only way. So there was no moral, uh, you know, there was no, um, no immorality involved in, um, in intermarrying in families. Now, I believe that this was the manner since Genesis chapter five, verse two says that Adam and Eve were the first and only persons created. So the only option then is for intermarrying with families. That changes later on and we'll see in the Bible where it's that, that idea changes, but for now, before the flood, this is the way it works. Now, we see this interfamily relationship in the early times in other situations, you know, Abraham marries his half-sister. No one says anything. Lot, Lot's daughters conceive through their father. Okay? So again, not the best thing, but nothing is said of it here. So Cain builds or begins to build because the verb here is indefinite, it means he was building this city. Perhaps it's an effort to stabilize his own wandering life. The city is named after his son Enoch, who becomes the first born city dweller, and it's left to him to rule the city and to continue Cain's line. Verse 18, it says, and now to Enoch was born Erad, and Erad became the father of uh, Mehuyel, Mahu Mehuyel, that's a hard one, and Mehuyel became the father of Methuselah, and Methuselah became the father of Lamech. And so the Cain family line is described here to provide a time bridge to a man called Lamech, who is a significant person in Cain's lineage. Now let's look at Lamech, verse 19, got a few minutes left. Lamech is the first recorded one to begin polygamy. Up until this time, there is no polygamy. And polygamy is a direct disobedience of God's law considering or regarding marriage. Now the names of his wives mean ornament, and shadow, suggesting their beauty and his 
attraction. I don't know if I read this verse yet. It says here, Lamech took to himself two wives. The name of one was Ada and the name of the other Zillah. Of course, the reason for this may not have been sexual lust, but rather the desire to have a larger family and faster, guaranteeing safety, prosperity in numbers, and strength in the community. Verse 20 to 22. Adah gave birth to Jabal, and he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. And his brother's name was Jubal, he was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. As for Zillah, she also gave birth to Tubal Cain, the forger of all implements of bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Na Naima. Naima. So we get a glimpse of the origins of various social developments as they take place in the era. You know, again, the Bible doesn't give a whole long description of all the things. It's like looking at the peaks, at the mountaintops of different you know, points in the development of human beings. And so uh, Jabal, for example, uh, invents tents that allow nomads to take, uh, to take their home with them. Also the keeping of cattle for commercial purposes. Uh, Jubal, uh, this is so interesting, I'll talk about this a little later on. The word jubal means sound, sound. So his ability produced both uh, stringed and reed instruments and the development of this art of music. And then they talk about Tubal Cain. Uh, not sure of his name, but he developed metal and um, uh, the use of these types of metal uh, products. Again, remember, these are city dwellers now as opposed to farming uh, individuals. So the descendants of Cain, these are not the only ones, but they mentioned these for a specific reason. The descendants of Cain no longer farm, but they begin to earn their living through commerce and manufacturing in a very basic way. And they were the prototype for those who live in the cities today. Now Henry Morris, and I've mentioned him before, the Genesis flood, he's written other books, but he's a creationist. He says that man's attempt to thwart God's curse, remember what the curse is, you can't live them from the ground, you'll be a wanderer. So what does man do? Instead of being a wanderer, he, he establishes a city. He tries to, to be in one place. God said, no, no, you're going to wander. No, no, they, they're going to stay in one place. Same thing with the Tower of Babel. You know, God said, you know, go ahead and you know, multiply and cover the earth. And they went, no, no, we're all going to go to one place and we're going to build this tower. And so, so it's always man fighting God's command. So Henry Morris says that man's attempt to thwart God's curse is illustrated by the development of Cain's ancestors ending with the seventh generation at uh, uh, Lamech. So here, here are some of the comparisons he makes. First of all, uh, social development. So let's, you know, remember I said we're backing up, we're looking at social development. So let's look at the social development. Well, first of all, urban life versus country life. Urban life is now preferred over tilling of the ground and eating the produce from the ground. Now it's urban life that is becoming you know, prevalent, beginning to develop. The second one is nomadic life preferred over settled life. And we're not talking about things that happen in a day here. We're just talking about trends that begin as we see the lineage of Cain evolve. Uh, meat eating versus vegetarian. Cattle raising is now developed to satisfy man's appetite for meat in rejection of God's command regarding vegetation for food. Up until this point, God has said, you know, I've given you all the trees, the fruit, the vegetation, I've given you all of this for your food. He has not authorized the eating of animals. That only comes in Genesis you know, after the flood, and we'll, we'll see that afterwards. So this also, the diet begins to change. Um, uh, ma uh, Metalworking or manufacturing is developed to ease the curse of, t uh, of the toiling of the ground. The ground is not favorable to them anymore, so they develop tools and so on and so forth to, to, to kind of you know, overcome that, that obstacle. 
Interesting, music versus prayer. Musical instruments and the development of music used to mitigate sorrow. We know, we know that works, don't we? Have you not ever been in a car on a beautiful summer day and your favorite song comes on, and I, everybody's favorite song is different, but your favorite song comes on, you go, oh, I like that when you crank that baby up and the windows go down and the pedal to the metal. And, or a song you hear and it kind of brings you back to when you were a kid, you know, oh man, those are the days. Or another song, that's our song, you know, married people, we all have our song. When we hear that, it makes us feel either nostalgic or sad or happy or whatever. The idea I'm getting across is that music has a way of affecting our emotions. What did, the, what did King Saul do when he was sad, when he was disturbed, when he was troubled, what did he do? Well, he called, he went and found a guy to play the, an instrument. David, right, would come and play and sing for him to try to soothe his soul. Now, there's nothing wrong with music, obviously, but the use of that type of activity to replace the thing that really does work in you know, helping us when we are sad or afraid or sorrowful, and that is prayer. And it's not an either or thing. You know, music is good, prayer is better for that particular, you know, for that particular issue. Um, polygamy, polygamy versus monogamy, especially introduced, again, not just from sexual reasons, but introduced to gain advantage in social class. And if you go to countries that still practice polygamy today, the major reason for polygamy is class. The more wives you have, the more respect you have, the richer you are, okay? So we're seeing that development there. Um, metallic weapons are introduced to guarantee positions and to establish positions. Where there's sin, there's war. Where there's war, there are weapons. And whoever's got the biggest weapons, you know, they're the big dog. So we, again, we just see the evolution of those things and then writing and art used to rail against God. In other words, humanism versus theism. And you wonder, where does that come from? Humanism versus theism, you know, art, using art uh, to rail against God. Let's read Lamech's poem in chapter, nine verse, or chapter four, rather, verse 23 and 24. It says, Lamech said to his wives Ada and Zillah, Listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. So what does he do? He boasts of his strength as a warrior and the fact that he has killed someone for attacking him. Well, have we come far from the original you know, creation of Adam and Eve in the garden? He boasts that he is greater than his ancestor Cain because God would only avenge Cain's killer seven times. But boy, if anybody attacks me, it's 70 times seven. And that was simply a way of saying the vengeance would be unending, powerful. Anyone attacking him would give back 70 times that much. And so we see poetry here used in a blasphemous manner. And you know, we, have all poets done that? Well, of course not. Have all musicians done that? Well, of course not. You know, Beethoven, you know, Beethoven in every one of his manuscripts would begin by writing, to God be the glory because he understood that the gift that he had, the gift of music and the, the genius that he had to create music was a gift from God. And so he believed that he ought to you know, honor God with the gift that he has. Amen. We, we can say amen to that. But we also know that there are people today, yes, and he was deaf on top of that, right? Uh, we also know that people today also use art and music to do exactly the opposite. We don't even have to go you know, through that, we've heard it on the radio, the, the language that is used, the idea, the misogyny and the hatred and the violence that is glamorized, and the movies that are made, pornography, all of that is, quote, a form of art. 
Okay? But you wonder, well, where does that start? Well, we see, we see a kind of a glimpse of it here. Seven generations from Cain, this is where we're at. We're, we're, we're using art to blaspheme God. So in these developments, we see the seed of Cain influenced by Satan and the steady deterioration, not only of one man, but of society in general. And that's what Genesis is doing here. It's showing us the slow decline of society. They're looking less and less like the people in the garden and seven generations later, as I mentioned, they're actually producing blasphemous poetry. Okay, so that's our lesson for this time. Next time, we're going to go back you know, to a personal close-up view, take a look at the seed of woman and follow that particular trajectory. All right, that's it for this session. Thank you very much.